This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives, a fee only financial advising firm and co host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. I'm Kevin Farrell, here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Freshwater fishing opportunities abound in Mississippi. We have more than 4,000 miles of streams and 282,000 acres of lakes and reservoirs in our state. So today we welcome back Dennis Rickey from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks to talk fishing and the Ramps and Piers program. Where are the new ramps located? Who can use them? And of course, what's biting this time of year? Also, Dr. Majors here, ready for your pet questions. Libby always likes to talk to you about your encounters with nature. Join our conversation this morning. You can email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. I always like to remind you that if you miss Creature Comforts on Thursdays, it repeats Saturday mornings at 6. So good morning. Let's uh, start with you, Libby. What are you seeing uh, out your window out there in Oregon these days? Oh, right now I'm watching an Anna's hummingbird. I've got two hummingbird feeders up, and I've had Anna's and rufus sighted hummingbirds, but or rufus hummingbirds but um i wish that i could see my feeders in mississippi uh those of you that are feeding hummingbirds probably have a whole bunch right now this is the fall migration and the the birds up north are coming south and mississippi is one of the places they like to be right now they'll continue south and most of them will, you know, will, will fly on, leave Mississippi in the next few weeks. But right now is a great time to see hummingbirds in Mississippi. And um, But I'm enjoying, uh, in fact, I guess the odd thing today for us Mississippians, it's 55 degrees on my patio, so mm. it's cold. And there's this little hummingbird um, having a great time. She'll be here all winter, or they stay, you know, in Oregon all winter, so they... Um, get frosty but they they're just a little bit bigger you know people say well they're bigger and hardier but they're still a tiny little bird to be out in the winter it amazes me and oh one of the things we've really enjoyed seeing this week are the california quail uh all summer we've we've seen them but um when the uh when the chicks are smaller you know oh it's absolutely adorable that classic the California quail have those plumes on their head. It's what I think five or six feathers that kind of join together in a strange way. So it's a plume that bobs along and they stay mostly on the ground. That's, you you know, they fly into our yard and then search everything out. And they have a little place where they take dust baths. And it's uh, yesterday, there were probably two dozen of them all congregated here in a fairly small area, dust bathing and, you know, checking around for insects. And I eat, I guess they eat all kinds of seeds, but um, eat also insects and they'll take berries when they can find them and just delightful sounds. So quite a variety of sounds. Every now and then the male goes up and um, flies on the edge of a fence and makes his calls. And I, I don't know if he's the the ringleader or not, but he um, he acts like it. He kind of, you know, does a dominance kind of thing. But there are other adult males. They all very social and hang out together. So anyway, that's my, my time here. But I want to hear what's going on in Mississippi. Well, let me, I had a Facebook friend who, who posted about uh, the hummingbirds here, and she said that she, they really seem like they, I don't know if fight is the right word, but they're very uh, competitive trying to get to the feeder. Um, and yes. If that's the case and someone can, would it be a good idea just to put up another feeder to kind of spread the wealth out a little bit? Yeah. And you remember we, um, I think it was Emma Rhodes that last talked to us about hummingbirds, but they suggest you spread them out and maybe don't have them in areas where they can see each other. I, I was a little bit successful at my house when I would put them 
like on three sides of the house instead of having the feeders all on one side. Of course, that way I couldn't see them all from one spot. Um, so okay. I've got two hummingbird um, feeders here. I don't think the Annas fight each other as much as the um, ruby-throated in Mississippi just because I've got two hummingbird feeders right now and they can see each other in their you know, they're not fighting at all. They're just eating. They're, they're cooperating. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so the 2022 Public Waters Alligator Hunting Season closed on September 5th, but not before a new state record for the longest female alligator was taken by two Mississippi alligator hunters. Jim Denson and Richie Denson of Madison killed the alligator, which measured 10 feet and 2 inches long on the Pearl River, about 5 miles north of the Ross Barnett Reservoir. Also, a hunting party named the Muddy Water Maniacs harvested a male alligator measuring at 13 feet 1 inch, weighing 635 pounds. That was one of the biggest of the season. So, wow, that's... Uh, incredible to to the creatures that large i'm not sure i would want to be that but i'm sure they're all very experienced in hunting and it, I, ma I imagine it's quite a challenge for the hunters so um so dr major last week would have been an all pet day but we weren't on the air so we do have a couple of uh, pet emails here for you some interesting ones actually this first one says can dogs use litter boxes or is it only for cats if so i have a five uh, i mean a four-year-old dog that's is that too old to try a litter box um if it is too old, could a puppy be started with a litter box? Very good question. Uh, I would say that dogs can be trained to use a litter box. Uh, a lot of people use uh, what we call pee pads, the little pads that you can put down, and I can train dogs to go to those. I have heard of dogs, though, that were trained to a litter box. It's just not quite the same uh, feel to them, I think, as a cat. Uh, and I know that... Uh, uh, you can train pretty much to go anywhere as far as on the pee pads or in the litter box. The older dog, the four-year-old, I think would be very difficult uh, to train. Uh, but you would say then if it were a puppy, you would recommend more the pads than, uh, than the litter box. Each probably would work, but maybe it sounds more natural with the, with the pads. It does seem to be a better, better alternative, but uh, certainly worth trying. Uh, you know, puppies even more so than cats are going to want to play in the litter box. And uh, I could see how that could be uh, litter all over the place uh, <laughs> if my puppies would be any indication. Of that. That's true. So you certainly don't want, uh, and, and cats spread litter in, uh, around enough as it is. And I know it's difficult sweeping it up and stuff. So you don't want your dogs right. uh, playing around in that. Here's another interesting one. It says, I have two male dogs, a miniature dachshund and a German shepherd Doberman mix. Would it create a problem between the dogs as far as getting along and things like that if we had the dachshund neutered but not the German Shepherd? Okay, so both males, they want to possibly neuter the dachshund and not the German Shepherd. Right. Uh, certainly it would be a step in the right direction, I would think. Uh, I, I'm not so sure that... I don't know how old they are. How old did they say they were? Uh, it does not mention that. And that could make a big difference. You know, if you've got some age, it might not be as much of a help as it could be if they were fairly young. So I guess if they're listening, if they could kind of clarify that, uh, and it might help. I can't say that uh, you, you never know. Uh, individual uh, can be uh, quite easily, uh, let's say, you know, neutered and change its disposition, this sort of thing. On the other hand, I know dogs that have been neutered that are uh, just as rambunctious and some are just as, you know, if they have interaction between the two, they may not change the best way I could put that. All right. Uh, we've got an early caller on the line, so why don't we bring uh, Hal, who's called in from Oxford, into the conversation. Good morning, Hal. You're on the air with us, so go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Um, about a year ago, when I moved into my apartment, I bought these freshwater snails to go in my fish tank from PetSmart and I asked the lady at the time if I needed to worry about them like reproducing or anything because I've seen that on the internet and stuff you know like the snails taking over a tank and I was worried about that she said no admit that they wouldn't reproduce in captivity but then I've had them about a year but now about a week ago I went down there and there was just a bunch of little like li like about ch like chia seed sized tiny snails wow. all in my tank uh, Dr. Major, any thoughts on, on what he might do or uh, controlling the snail population? 
several things I can think of immediately. Number one, nature can find a way. If you uh, watch Jurassic Park, you know that, <laughs> uh, that that's yeah. a possibility. The other thing is please don't let these out into the waterways or even flush them because they could survive and could cause a problem. I'm not sure exactly what kind of snails they are, but they could be a problem. So I would <laughs> take them back like if you had a, you know, somebody said the cat was not pregnant and you took it in and you said, hey, I'm going to take the kittens back to the person who gave me the okay. cat. Well, I don't know that that would work with the snails, but I would say that uh, certainly they could be a problem if turned into the environment. Libby, did you have a, a thought? Well, an interesting thing about snails is they um, they can change their sex. Hmm. If there are no females and they're all males, some of them can change. And um, as they get older, they can change sex. So they, they definitely find a way. And uh, there have been problems with invasive snails all over the world. So Terry's comment about keeping them isolated and being sure you don't let them out into waterways is the truth. Don't flush them down the toilet either because that does eventually go to the Pearl River. So um, if you want to get rid of them, you're going to have to find another way to do that or take them back to the pet store. Yeah, Hal, I'm not sure what it would do, but I, I think especially if, if you went in there and said, hey, look, you folks told me this wouldn't happen and now it has. I don't know if they would take them back, but that might be, you know, a first place to start. So, uh Hopefully uh, that works out well, and we appreciate uh, you giving us a call this morning. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest today is Dennis Rickey. We're going to be talking about fishing this hour. If you want to join our conversation with a question or a comment, send us an email. It's animals at mpbonline.org. So, Dennis, we appreciate you being on the air with us again uh, this morning. Uh, what, uh, when people are fishing, what sorts of things are they catching uh, this time of year? In the spillways, um, it's uh, usually a good time of year for catfish. In our federal reservoirs up north, um, a little bit later, as the water temperature cools off, the crappie will come into the shoreline, and it's a, it's a popular fishing time. Uh, you can usually catch a, a bass and, and bluegill uh, at this time of year, um, Right in the morning, early in the morning, late in the evening with low light conditions seem to be the best times, you know. You know, earlier we mentioned the alligator hunting season, uh, and I, I think that's done every year as, as a, to help control the population, I guess. Is that right? That's correct. Um, you know, we've gone from a period when alligators were on the threatened or endangered species list, and the habitat was always there for them. We just took uh, the over-harvest out of the equation, and... And uh, also DDT was affecting uh, alligator uh, hatching viability. So um, now they're, I think they're in every county in the state. And uh, so um, we can allow some harvest of them, sport harvest anyway. Yeah, it's been very popular. And as I mentioned to me, it's one of those where I'm not sure I would want to go, but if you go, it must be exciting. Have you ever been on an alligator hunt? I have not. Uh, I do know that the department had... Uh, um, in-person training for several years uh, to make sure it was done safely and no one got bit, no one got hurt. And now it's uh, online training, and, and we haven't had any, um, any problems, and that's good. We don't want any problems. Right. I think the last time you were with us, we talked about uh, some of the fishing reports that, uh, that I think uh, MDWFP uh, generates. So can people access that information, and how do they go about finding it, and what information can they get? Yeah, that's, uh, that's on our website. So when you go to www.mdwfp.com, there's going to be a tab, and it's going to say Fishing and Boating. And you click on that tab, and on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see fishing reports. And it's uh, broken down by region of the state and also water body name. So if we get reliable reports from um, a location, uh, each week they're updated. Uh, the information has to be there by Wednesday. And uh, we do that every week until, I think, the end of, either October or November. And then we take a 
We post a generic message for the winter time, and then we start up again in, in February. We're going to be visiting with Dennis throughout the hour, but uh, we do have a caller on the line. I think it looks like a snail question coming from Carol in Ocean Springs. Good morning, Carol. You're on the air with us, so go ahead. Good morning. I just had a um, thought maybe the fishing guy could answer, which is, is, is there something there may be that would eat the snails? That was it. Um, probably if the snail is not too big and the, and the shell is not too hard, red ear or uh, shell cracker are, are known to eat uh, snails and, um, uh, little clams, things like that. Um, blue catfish may eat them, but usually they're not found in, in ponds, um, this is in an aquarium. Oh, this is in an aquarium. Um, usually no. not. Uh, I'm trying to think of some aggressive fish that I've heard about, but I don't think any of them um, are known to be snail eaters. Libby, what are your thoughts? Well, I think when the snails are more likely to be eaten by the fish are when they're small, you know, when they're just hatching. So that's, and the snail eggs, of course, can be eaten by a lot of things. And don't you think, Dennis, I think a lot of fish would probably eat those. Um, yes. I've heard of, of, that's, I know that's one of the checks and balances in aquariums for exotic snails. When you've got exotic fish and exotic snails, usually the fish will keep the population down and eat the um, any of the newly hatched ones. But, uh in in a natural environment, you know, one of the things that eats a lot of snails are the wading and shorebirds. That's what a lot of birds are looking for, invertebrates, not so much small fish. Sometimes we, we just assume that everything's eating fish if it's in a, a wet environment. But a lot of times uh, those birds are looking for th just just such a thing as a snail. But that said, we still don't want to let those exotic snails out. Right. All right, Carol, thanks for your call this morning. Um so, I mean, Dennis, I guess with the with the shell, they, they, you really couldn't use them as bait, I would suppose. Uh, I wouldn't want to use them as bait. <clears throat> because, if, again, we're talking about we don't want to let these things out in our natural bodies of water. Yeah. Right. And so if, if they're too abundant in the aquarium, um, they do serve a role in the aquarium to eat waste, and some of them eat algae on the sides of the aquarium. But if they're too abundant, scoop them out with a little... A little dip net and put them in a uh, a Tupperware container, uh, and put them in your freezer, and um, that will kill them in a fairly humane manner. And then you could dispose of them in the trash. All right, very good. So hopefully our other caller is still listening. That seems like probably uh, the best op uh, 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 solution to the the problem. So um, Dennis, do we know percentage wise how much of the state's fishing is done on banks versus how much is done from boats? Uh, we do on specific water bodies, and uh, we do have a statewide uh, angler survey that was done years ago. Um, it just depends on the location uh, and, and the access also. If, uh, if bank access is limited or, or, or poor, uh, you're going to get more boating uh, uh, access uh, or boat use. And so I would say the, in, in the big water bodies... Um, the reservoirs, we probably got more boating use. And in the state fishing lakes and, and state park lakes and smaller water bodies in, in, in cities, you get bank use. It predominates. Uh, at the opening of the show, we mentioned the Ramps and Piers program. If you could tell us uh, what's that all about. Okay. So um, under what's called the Sport Fish Restoration Act, which is a tax that you pay probably unknowingly when you buy fishing equipment and and trolling motors and fish finders and when you put gasoline into your boat there's a formula that uh, all that tax revenue is collected uh, the manufacturer actually pays it and, and it's passed on to you through retail sales and the Fish and Wildlife Service gets the money and divvies it up to the states based on number of uh, licensed anglers and um, land size and water acreage and so 
under that piece of legislation, uh, we're uh, required to spend 15% of it on access. And access uh, is, is boat ramps. And so since about probably 85 or so, uh, the department has uh, a four-person crew, and we have bulldozers and track hoes. And we build ramps, um, mostly on land that we lease. A lot of ramps are located uh, next to bridges on highway department right-of-ways. But we do lease some land, and and occasionally we do buy some land to build uh, boat ramps. So um, we've built over the years, uh, I think, that are still active in our database is about 250 ramps, usually concrete ramps. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting. You mentioned that uh, part of the formula for how much money we get, uh, the state gets from that, is based on the number of anglers. So I get that's just another reason why you want, if you're a fisherman in Mississippi, you want to make sure that you get that license. Yes, and and you know, um, uh, people over sixty five residents uh, are exempt from the license requirements, and they would have to provide proof of their age with a driver's license or even if if they're disabled they have to uh, they're exempt and they need to provide proof of their disability but i always tell them look for you know five bucks a year you can buy a voluntary senior citizen or disabled uh, um, license and all you gotta do is show that and it helps us out because therefore they're they're a licensed angler so it helps us get more federal money we're going to continue talking to Dennis throughout the hour, but we do have another caller on the line. A hummingbird question coming from Jesse and Raymond. Good morning, Jesse. You're on the air with us. Hey, how are you? Listen, my hummingbird feeders, they're just swarming around them right now. And um, I just want to know when the season, the migration would peak here. In other words, when we get our biggest surge and when it's going to trail off. I mean, I want to keep these guys fed and I want to fatten them up if I can for their long trip across the Gulf. But uh, they're wearing me out. You know what I mean? Yes, I know. I mean, honestly. Yeah, every year. Yeah. They're okay. going through two quarts a day. <laughs> you, you may be. A bit, now, what, what part of the state are you in? I'm in Raymond. Oh, okay. So in Raymond. Oh, I I can do some checking around to see exactly when people predict a peak. But you're probably going to have them for the next month at least okay, you know well, usually well. september usually about this time in september you know maybe the second week they really start getting a lot of them and then they'll they'll be trailing out you know in october so you won't have quite so many but you may be at peak about now is this the most you've ever seen on your feeders absolutely yeah i've got usually 30 at a time just uh, i've got five feeders and you know, the, uh, what, 12-ounce feeders or something like that? But, uh, yeah. But they're just crazy. And they're all, of course, they're ruby-throated. And um, we don't get yeah. the Rufus hummingbirds here anymore, do we? Or do we? They do come some. You know, it's an occasional thing. But, um, you know, when Emma Rhodes was talking to us not long ago, she there was a report of a Rufus that she was trying to catch in the Jackson area to put a band on. But um, so, you know, they're certainly around and every year you can you can kind of go online and, and check which species are being seen where. But there are always a few odd, you know, a few odd birds that come in in the winter. And um, a lot of hummingbird feeders make it a point to keep feeders out in the winter to catch those stray ones. And, you know, sometimes they are certainly able to do it. And if you get one one year and feed it, they do tend to come back the next year. So you can, you know, if you, depends on how much time you want to commit. But, uh, you know, I, I get like you too some years. I'm, I feel like, oh, no, I've got to get another five pounds of sugar today. Yeah. Ten. Yeah. You, <laughs> they can wear you out. And you got to keep those things real clean. Oh, I do. I do. I do. Yeah. I clean them I knew, I yeah. I could, yeah. If you've got 30, you, you're doing everything right, I'm sure. But um, good luck. And you might in, uh, see if you can enlist some neighbors to start feeding, too. Thanks a Spread lot. Spread the Lydia. birds I really out. Appreciate it. Uh, okay. And thanks for letting bye. us know. Thank- right. Bye bye. 
Thanks, Jesse, for your call. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. It's Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio, and today our guest is Dennis Rickey from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. If you want to join the conversation, you can email animals at mpbonline.org. Looks like we've got a call about managing lakes, and it comes from Don in Union County. You're on we are with us, Don, so go ahead. Uh, good morning. Morning. Uh, I have a quick comment for the lady. I think her name was Carol, who called in about uh, snails in her aquarium. Yes. I just wanted to say that uh, a male betta will attack everything, and we had to remove the larger snails from our aquarium. Okay. He was he was biting pieces off the shell <clears throat> and damaging his own mouth in the process. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um. My question is about uh, my little lake. It's five acres. Um, I stocked it 10 or 12 years ago with uh, a mixture of northern strain and Florida strain bass, uh, an 80-20 mix of copper nose brim and shell crackers, and some channel cats, which are now all gone. Um, my question is about uh, <clears throat> how to manage for big bass in the pond. I corresponded with a fellow from Mississippi State when I first set it up, and he suggested uh, releasing everything 14 inches and under, uh, and that would pretty much, uh, I'm sorry, keep everything 14 inches and under and release all, everything bigger than that. Well, I altered it just a little bit and went to a 15-inch uh, minimum for release. And I haven't been seeing as many of the larger bass in the last two or three years. And I just wonder if I messed up by that one-inch change in the recommendation. No, I wouldn't say you messed up. Um, so probably the best uh, population in terms of big bass that people and uh, in, in ponds and in lakes that uh, occurs is about... Uh, when the bass are maybe six or seven years old, so you've got three more years on them than that if, if some survive past that time. So um, what size are your, your bluegill? Uh, they're nice and big, hand size from the tip of my fingers up to my wrist. Mm -hmm. And so, and so in, in five acres, about how many um, bass would you say – uh, that you take out under 14 inches every year? Well, uh, the biologist I talked to recommended 10 bass per acre. So for the first years of management, uh, I would cut off the harvest when we reached 50 bass. Uh, since they've been running small the last couple of years, I have dropped that, and we just keep everything uh, below the releasing size. Okay. I would have recommended uh, uh, 10 to 20 pounds of bass per acre per year. But you're doing good at keeping all the bass under that size. I would continue that. And um, you still have big bluegill. Are you feeding the bluegill, or are they just naturally big like that? It, it's all natural. they got to make it on their own. Okay. Well, th that's a sign that the bass are still crowded and they're eating up most of the bluegill because uh, the ones that remain can't be eaten, so they, they have an abundant food supply. And uh, so um, I would keep harvesting er everything under 15 inches. It's going to take a couple years to, to, to turn it around. So you're, doing, you're on the right track. Okay, good. I was just a little concerned about it, and it, it may be my imagination. You know, there may not be a problem there. but uh, And we do have a, a good many of small brim in there, too. It's not exclusively big ones. There's a lot of small ones that I throw back. I mean, what's the biggest bass you've caught so far? Uh, just under eight pounds. Well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I, I, I mounted that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good for we, you. We've caught two that size out of the lake. Good. All right, Don, thanks for your call this morning. This is Creature Comforts on MPP Think Radio. Dennis, I think I have a new favorite name for fish. I've never heard of shell crackers before, but I like the way that sounds. Yeah. <laughs>
So I get, they eat shelled things and crack them with their mouths? Mm-hmm. All right. That's one of, the, one of the local names for a red ear. Um, we were talking about uh, the RAMPS program, and who is uh, MDWFP responsible for maintaining and repairing the RAMPS as well? Usually what we do when we have a lease agreement is um, that's stipulated in the lease agreement, and the lease agreements are with the counties and the county board of supervisors. So some of them, the county has said that they would they would uh, do a maintenance agreement, and uh, they do. Uh, we we look in our lease agreement, and, and if we've got a complaint that people can't get in because of mud or silt, uh, we contact the board of supervisors and. Some of them do a good job, and some of them don't do a good job. And when they don't do it, uh, we we take care of it. Uh, and in some lease agreements, it's always been our responsibility. So we get those calls, uh, particularly during a, a fishing time and after a big flood event. And, uh, you know, I want to use this ramp, and I can't get in it. And our crew will go out and clean it off. Um, how can uh, boaters find a ramp near where they live? Uh, again, on on our website under that fishing and boating page, there's a there's a ramps link, and you can search if you know uh, the county you want to go to, or if you know the water body name, you can search by either of those two uh, criteria, and it'll give you uh, a list of ramps, and you click on the link uh, to a, a ramp name, um, and uh, or a water body name or a county name and there's going to list is going to come up and just click on one of those and it'll tell you the gps locations how to drive to get there whether it's a a concrete ramp whether it has parking you know so it's it's really convenient it's, it's probably about 400 and ramps in there some of them we didn't do uh some of them are you know privately owned but it's they're open to the public for a small fee yeah um, so I would imagine primarily anglers, but I guess anybody who wants to go boating or on the on the water bodies could use these? Sure. You know, people who want to go skiing, if you want to go launch your canoe or your kayak, paddle around, jet ski, whatever. Yeah, it's it's not restricted to to fishermen. We've been talking about snails based on a call we got from Oxford earlier in the hour. Uh, Regina's on the line in Jackson. Good morning, Regina. What do you have for us? I was wondering why uh, there are these exotic and these uh, uh, unnatural uh, species are allowed to be sold in uh, the pet stores. You know, they come in on these uh, freight ships and people sneak them in on the airports and stuff. But and they, and Im- and the immigration try to catch, uh, well, whoever try to catch them. Why are they allowed to be sold in the, in the pet stores? knowing that they would be detrimental to, you know, our natural species? Well, historically, we have not, uh, state fishing game agencies and the federal government has not um, restricted what people could have uh, at home as pets. Um, There are some species that... uh, the federal government did restrict a long time ago, and they have continued to restrict some. Um, at one time, English sparrows, startlings, you know, things that became invasive. Um, now, recently, the the last time they took action on some of those species was the big snakes, you know, the constrictors, the pythons, and the and the bow constrictors and and things like that. And uh, they put them on the list, and the, uh, I think it was called American Reptile Keepers, uh, objected, and so uh, they got taken off the list because of an interpretation of wording by a court. But um, I'm not concerned uh, about what people have in their aquarium. Um, I'm concerned about the release, and people dump their aquariums, uh, the fish get too big, or or they take island apple snails and they release them. Um, They just can't bear to to kill the animal. Uh, I'll suggest taking them back to the pet store 
Um, we do restrict what people can put outside in ponds. And basically, it's uh, um, the only non-natives that you can have outside in your pond uh, is a goldfish, a common carp, and a triploid grass carp, which will eat plants and won't reproduce in your pond. So, um, and we do have a restriction since about 1990 where uh, it's a, a, a class one violation, which means you can't put anything into the public waters of the state, release it, uh, or, or attempt to release it without permission from wildlife, fisheries, and parks. And the only reason for that permission thing is if Kevin wanted to donate some largemouth bass to put in a river or lake, we would like to take that, you know, but we wouldn't want to take snakeheads or uh, tilapia. So, um, and the penalty for that is uh, a 2000 to $5,000 fine. So the take-home message for pet owners is to be responsible and uh, not release things in the wild. And if you see someone doing that, call us. Thanks, Regina, for your call. And I guess I would say, too, that if you uh, have an aquarium uh, to do your research, you know, our producer Java was uh, kidding around with us and said, you know, the the high school graduate at PetSmart might not really know what they're talking about. So because of things like that that can happen, maybe make sure you do your research and you know what's what you're putting in your aquarium and what's there, you know, uh, because those all those creatures are having to get to, to live together in the same environment. So you want to make sure you know what you're doing before you get in, maybe in over your head. So, so Dennis, is there a process for someone who thinks they might like to have maybe a boat ramp near where they are and they don't have one to possibly get one built at a, at a new location? Yes, there is. We get those requests uh, uh, every year and we can build about two to four ramps a year. Um, you just call, uh, Wildlife Fisheries and Parks, uh, the Fisheries Bureau at 601-432-2200 and say you got an idea for a ramp location. And we'll check it out and see how close your location is to the existing ramps. And uh, if it's too close, we'll, we'll decline. Um uh, but the next thing is if it's if it's not too close and we think we need a ramp in that area, we're going to have to search for uh, uh, landowners that will give us a lease or look at road crossings, uh, bridges, and things like that. Um, and uh, then sometimes we can even uh, buy, buy uh, land for sale and put a ramp in, yeah. Got some calls to get to before we wrap things up. We'll go back to Oxford. Jimmy has called in today. Good morning, Jimmy. You're on the air with us, so go ahead. Good morning. I have a small little fish pond in my backyard. It's actually it's a fountain I made in my country, and I got nine little goldfish in there, and I can't control the algae. If there's anything I can put in there that won't hurt my goldfish. Uh, some people have used, in your situation, uh, barley, straw, uh, there, uh, you could use some, uh, perhaps some copper containing compounds that wouldn't hurt your goldfish. It depends upon the hardness and softness of your water. Uh, why don't you give me a call at, uh, uh, 601-432-2200 in, in about an hour and, uh, I'll see if I can't come up with something for you. What's that, what's that number again? 601-432-2200. Ask for Dennis. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, uh, Jimmy, for your call. Uh, so, Dennis, before we run out of time, we mentioned uh, fishing licenses a little bit earlier, but if you could review who needs a license, who's exempt, and, again, why you think it's a, a good idea to, to officially get one. Okay, so if you're a resident... Uh, between the ages of 16 and 64, you do need a, a fishing license to fish in the, the fresh waters of the state. Um, you need it also to uh, fish in ponds, uh, private ponds. The landowner doesn't need it to fish in their own pond. 
Um, all non-residents over the age of 16 need a license. Uh, disabled people, people who are 100% disabled or, or exempt, uh, and residents over 65 are exempt. Um, you could get a combination resident hunting and fishing license, I think, for $9.29. So it's really a good deal. Um, let's see. And then, as we mentioned earlier, it, it benefits the state in, in a number of ways. Yes, it does. I mean, the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks gets very little general fund money. We're principally a self-funded agency through hunting and fishing licenses, uh, boat registrations, fees at our state parks and state fishing lakes, and that federal um, sport fish restoration money. And there's also a wildlife uh, side to that, too. So um, that provides the money that we operate on. And, uh, you know, we operate uh, 20-something state fishing lakes. We probably bring in half a million dollars, and it costs a million and a half to operate them. So it's like a service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, a couple minutes left. We've got uh, one final call to get to. It's uh, Jack who's on the line this morning. Go ahead, Jack. You're on the air with us. All right, thanks for taking my call. Uh, This is a question. Is anybody on there knows how to identify uh, armadillo? hole where the bur- bird in the ground i got a couple of old cars where uh i noticed it real sudden like they they dug up about uh two foot of dirt underneath the old vehicle but i don't see many tracks but it's, it's a big mound of uh, about two foot diameter where they kick the dirt out how do you know what it is and how do you get rid of an armadillo libby any thoughts on that Oh, gosh. All right. I'm no expert, but there are people that really are good at telling which burrow is which thing. You know, I've kind of learned what's a gopher tortoise and what's not a gopher tortoise. But I know that an armadillo's burrow is very rounded. You know, it's, so it's it's close. It's not a, you know, not a complete circle, but it's a or not a, a perfect circle, but it's pretty well rounded. There'll be, you know, a little bit of track leading up to it. But beyond that, you probably need to go online and just Google identifying an armadillo bird. You'd probably be surprised at how much information you get. And and Dennis, if he were to call MDWFP, would someone there kind of be able to give him some information? Yeah, we can put him on to someone and even some trappers. But you might go out at night with a flashlight and look around the yeah. burrow, and maybe you could see what type of animal that is. All right, Jack. Uh, so, yeah, maybe some research online or contacting MDWFP, uh, going to their website, which is www.mdwfp.com. Lots of great information that's there. We've learned over the years when we have guests from there on our show. So we appreciate you uh, giving us a call. So uh, we've got about a minute left, Dennis. You know, I mentioned that uh, in the park that I walk in Pearl, they're having a youth uh, fishing rodeo in a couple of weeks. And if, if you're out, uh, have kids that are, have uh, maybe developed an interest in fishing, those fishing rodeos are a great way to get, well, not just kids, but anybody kind of introduced to the, the sport of fishing. Yes, they are. Um, and sometimes we provide poles, and, and sometimes people bring their poles. We'll have some bait. Uh, the fish will be stocked in there, sometimes in a net, sometimes just in the pond. And... Uh, it's a really good way to introduce people to fishing. Uh, we have uh, probably six or eight more rodeos coming up in September and October, and then we'll stop and we'll pick up again in March. And yep. those are listed on our website, too. All right. I always like to remind you that if you're out and about and you see something that you don't know exactly what it is, if you can grab your smartphone and take a picture of it, and email it to animals at mpbonline.org. We'll see if we can't help you identify it. Libby has a great network of resources that she can uh, access. Uh, so if you, ha- Or if you just uh, see something that you think is interesting and you'd like to share a picture with us, we always like to get emails from you. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, and funding is provided by listeners. To, ta- here, to, ta- to hear today's show or a previous show, you can visit creaturecomforts.mpbonline.org. 
Our show is produced by Java Chapman, and our call screener today was Liz Gill. So for Libby Hartfield, Dr. Troy Major, and our guest Dennis Rickey, I'm Kevin Farrell. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app.